I'm Scott Fitzgerald. I believe this is my dance. Well, that depends on what you've got in that flask of yours. We can go anywhere and do anything we want. This place will forever be known as the place we met. Why are your initials so much bigger than mine, Scott Fitzgerald? Three thousand copies sold in three days. This is how you arrive in New York City. We will. <laughs> he basically married the heroine of his story. We will. You are a success. I will never let you fail. Those are my words from my letter. You use my words. Can't stay on top forever. I feel like I'm losing everything. May I introduce Mrs. Scott Fitzgerald? You can call me Zelda. Zelda! 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 Zelda. Continue. Hi. Continue giving it up for her. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Congratulations. This is an thank incredible you. role to have. Yeah, it's very exciting. I yeah. can't believe it, actually. So how, how, did the, how did this come about? I know Tim Blake Nelson directed the first couple episodes, oh. and it was created, I think, by him and a, couple other, and a couple other people, right? Well, I sourced this material. This is based on a book called Z, uh, a Zelda Fitzgerald novel by Therese Ann Fowler. And I read this book, just happened to read it, and uh, inquired after the option. The option was available, so I took it to Killer Films. And uh, Pam Koffler and I from Killer Films, we sent it out and Amazon picked it up and originally we pitched it as a limited series. And Amazon kind of had the vision to make it a bio series, a regular TV series. For those of you who don't know, Killer Films is oh, one of the great independent film production companies. Uh, that All the Todd Haynes movies, yeah. Todd Solon's movies, yes, and this is their first TV show, so. That's a big, uh, a big gamble to, to yeah. take, but it's incredible source material. Yeah. Let's talk uh, uh, initially about the, uh, about the novel itself. What, what, what intrigued you by it? Because it's not a biography of Zelda Fitzgerald. It is a novelization of, yeah, of her life. It's, it's a piece of historical fiction. So based on letters uh, between Scott and Zelda, um, Hemingway and Scott, and all kinds of letters. Um, but... The, the novelist, because people feel so precious about the, these characters, these figures, these icons, actually stayed as true to the facts as she could and just sort of um, the, the real kind of artistic license she took was in the book is, from, is a first person account from Zelda's point of view, which we've never really had before. Um, it's so important because Zelda's story has so often been told by by men, by men who are covering well, that period of well, time. Well, more specifically, men who didn't like her. So exactly, <laughs> Hemingway. Um, it's it is really interesting. Name a woman that Hemingway liked. Well, I that's mean. the thing. It's like well, we all know he was an asshole. So why are we listening to Hemingway? Um, I thought that was so shocking that because I, I I didn't know much about her. I knew sort of the common misconception that she was this crazy alcoholic woman who ruined F. Scott Fitzgerald's life. Um, and then, of course, the truth is so much more complicated than that. And there's so much about her story that people don't know. And the, all that information is out there. And the fact that we're perpetuating this, like, uh, this defaming of this woman is, uh, I, it really poked my sense of social justice. And I just really wanted to sort of redeem her and give her back her reputation. And even if she suffered from some kind of mental illness, which she was diagnosed schizophrenic at one point, we're also talking about a period of time where women who voiced opinions or who were sort of strong in, 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 their, vo in their opinions could be diagnosed for, for, for mental illness. Yeah, I mean, one of the big things that I've always noted in studying strong women in history, there's almost always a period of time when they have nervous breakdowns and are <laughs> like have to take a little respite in the asylum. So it's just, I, I, like, 
<laughs> I, I, I always found this, and I think it's so funny. And so when I read this, and I, I, I you know, and then I came upon that part, and, and that she was called schizophrenic, when really the, the, the um, factors that led up to her nervous breakdown are compl I would have had a nervous breakdown. Um, at, you, the, the struggle throughout their marriage was really that Zelda, Zelda was very lazy, and as a ch as a young person, very arrogant and naive, and she was raised as a Southern belle. So instead of really doing the hard work and going to college or fighting fighting to stand on her own first, she she relied on her looks, and she wanted she felt she could get get where she wanted to go through her marriage, and those choices ended up really biting her in the ass later because she framed herself in this way and then later decided, well, I don't want to be treated that way, you know? And given the time that she lived, it wasn't necessarily a time when you could change that, change those things. Um, so her struggle the whole time was to be a writer on her own, to be an artist on her own, and Scott was very competitive and insecure. And competitive with her at times. Well, yeah, because he didn't, he just, he was competitive with everyone. He didn't want, he always had to be the best person in the room, or the best person in the room. Um, and he loved her, and I, th I think they loved and hated each other for the same, for the same reasons, you know. Um, uh, so, and he used a lot of her writing, actually. In the beginning, she was so flattered to, to discover that he had used um, writing from her letters in his first book. This Side of Paradise? Yes. Just, uh, it, that is my favorite F. Scott Fitzgerald book, you know, and, and to hear that he used so much of her writing is, is, is in some ways kind of a travesty because it makes me want to read more of, of, of what she would have written. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting. It, at first, she was so flattered by it and, and then realized later, because it's funny because it, she was such a victim of her own ego. She was flattered that her writing was being used, flattered that he loved her for these like muse, that, and then didn't want to be that anymore. Didn't realize the chains it would really put on her. So she's flattered by the writing thing, and then finds out later, you know, somebody wanted to publish her journal at a certain point, and he would not let her publish under her own name because it would reveal how much of her write, his writing was hers. Um, so she was very frustrated by, by that. And then she was a ballerina um, in her youth, studied ballet the whole time. So, so when she, and she, the whole time she's being forced to spend time with women like Gertrude Stein and Dorothy Parker, who were allowed to stand on their own two feet and, and be their own, uh, be artists in their own right. So she really struggled searching for a way to be that. And so she went back to ballet at 27. She studied for a year with the Paris Ballet with like, teenagers. And um, she, she managed to get a spot in the Spanish ballet, which is kind of amazing at 27. And she was like anorexic and exhausted. And she really thought that he was gonna let her do it because he let her train for an entire year. And he said no. And that's when she had her nervous breakdown. So I mean, I would have a nervous breakdown too. <laughs> um, well, it's it's so interesting this idea of exploring uh, the dangers of of being a muse and what a muse actually means to the woman that is the muse. Because so often we say like, oh, she's a muse, and then we just think about what that means for the man who who thinks of that person that way. Yeah, it's very Pygmalion Galatea kind of thing, you know. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think I think one thing that's that I that I hope this story kind of lends itself to and, and people being aware of this, it I think it helps us identify how we as women maybe perpetuate misogyny. Because I think at this point, since we're still fighting for this, we're like and people are bewildered. You know, it's just why is this still why are things still so um, unequal? And I think at a certain point, we have to kind of look at ourselves as women and figure out what are we doing to feed into this. And I think if we can go back and look at individual stories like this, where people do make these mistakes and set themselves up in this way, then perhaps we can sort of start to apply that to each of our individual lives, thus hopefully raising the whole group up. <laughs> Absolutely. And, but that said, you know, Zelda, I think, comes from this situation where Initially, this is her only option to find freedom, and then once she finds that freedom through being a muse or sort of just being with F. Scott Fitzgerald, once she finds that freedom in New York and this whole sort of society where she meets people like Gertrude Stein, she realizes that she has a power. She can be empowered, but then it's almost too late. Yeah, it's too late, and 
Um, I'm sorry, I've been doing interviews all day, so That's if okay. I'm repeating myself, please excuse me. <laughs> um, but she had a, I don't know if I've mentioned, but she had a contemporary, Sarah Hart, mm -hmm. and they were both, they were raised in Montgomery together, they went to school together, they were both considered equally beautiful, um, equally charming, their, write, their talent, writing talent was equal on par, intelligence. Sarah decided to not get married, to go to one of the few women's colleges, and to become a writer before she got married, and Zelda, decided to get there on her looks and through the you know adoration of men, which she was very much, I think, addicted to. Now, I have to ask, this is such an obvious question, um, but as an actress, what made you relate to, to Zelda Fitzgerald? Did you relate to, to Zelda's story at all? I think so. I mean, I, I think that... And That's in no way to say that you got by on your looks or anything no, like no, that, but no. I would assume that actresses definitely feel like muses sometimes, for better or worse, to the sort of majority male directors that they have to work with. Yeah, that's true. But I think the thing that I identified with her more is sort of, you know, I was known in my past a little bit for being somewhat outrageous and for saying crazy things. And I, I feel like it's important, well, for, I just, she was known for being outrageous and doing things. And I think it's interesting what fame does to people. And I don't think, I think sometimes humanizing these icons and it just helps, it's just an exercise in empathy, you know? And um, so what I related to was really the effect their intense fame had on them as a couple. And that sort of like clamoring and that, that feeling that you were chasing this high. They were chasing this high the rest of their lives. And for me, my first introduction to the world was fame. And as a child, I think it, there's no way to contextualize that. So. It took me a very long time to realize that this wasn't normal, you know, and to try to find a way to, to put it in the right spot in my mind. How do you do that? Do you pull back as much as you can and then sort of find a way to work, I mean, with it or work around it once you retreat a little bit? I think I was just able to because of things that happened to me and because of my own, you know, because of my, the mistakes I made, I ended up not working as much <laughs> because of my crazy behavior probably. Um, or the crazy things I said, uh, but it, it allowed me to then kind of have some real life experience, um, you know, to deal with everyday kind of human experience things. And uh, I think that really grounded me and helped me put things in the right perspective. Do you think that we, as, as much as they're chasing fame in, in this, I would say that, you know, F. Scott, uh, or Scott at the beginning is chasing fame for the sake of his writing. He wants to be known famous as a fantastic writer. Do you think that that's a completely different kind of fame chasing than we have now? Well, this was the first example of ordinary people being famous. After World War I, the class system completely changed. So it wasn't about what family you came from or royalty and any of that stuff. It was all of a sudden everyday people um, could become famous through talent and things like that. And so I think that's one of the reasons they were such icons, is they were the first sort of relatable public figures, really, to a m huge amount of people. And so this kind of fame started at this time, the kind of fame that we understand now, the celebrity coupledom and all this stuff. So, so I think it is very different because it's changed so much. And as we've gotten used to famous people, we've wanted more more information, more details, more intimacy. So I think- We just take, take, take I, famous people. It's, it's, I'm, I'm dead Those serious. poor fame pe famous people. Um, no. Um, so I think, I think that it's just diff it, it is different now because it's just so much bigger. Uh, let's talk about sort of your work in developing this. So you bring it to Killer Films and, and, and you start developing it and Amazon decides to turn it into a, a regular show. What is your role in the development process, in the, in the writing process, and finding directors to, to work with, considering you're the one who sort of optioned this source material? I was very involved in everything. I, was, um, I stuck my nose into every, every aspect, even if it wasn't always wanted. <laughs> What was, what was that like? Was that the first time you've done that with a project? Yeah, yeah. This is really the first time I've ever really cared this much about anything. Um, and uh, it's because I just committed and fully, you know, gave my opinion and, and really fought for my say. And what would you say that your sort of, your, your main philosophy behind it was, what you consistently fought for? I think that the main contribution I have to this, besides my performance and uh, uh, 
is uh, I had a very strong concept for production design and the way this was actually shot. Um, because it is a first person account, um, and because there are so many different versions of this story from different points of view, I felt it was very important to tell this story through the lens of Zelda's memory and how memory affects uh, what you see. Um, and so to, to always shoot this in a way, uh, to execute this in a way that you always feel like Zelda's with you. And how we did that was we tweaked colors, shapes. We would carry shapes from one important moment in her life into another thing. Um, the colors she wears, or the, the colors you see, um, certain, certain colors represent Zelda, so if it's a scene she's not in, you'll see a color, and you just, you know, hopefully it's subtle enough, but, but strong enough that you feel just this sense of her. And her presence, because it's her this, memory. Yeah, yeah, and the awareness that she is the one holding your hand, walking you through the, her memory. And how did you cast uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald? We, you know, we auditioned tons of people, and uh, David was just great. David looks, Hoffman. He looks a lot like him. Yeah, yeah. Was that like the you're like, yo, you look exactly like him? We got. Well, out. we had to pick somebody who could believably be that person, so it was an element. So you get into, the, you know, this is the first project that you said you've cared enough about to really sort of be a part of every element of it. As, as the actress uh, who's also wants to sort of, who is a part of the sort of production process, how much are, were you willing to stick your nose in? Or did you ever feel insecure about how much you could stick your nose in? I felt hugely insecure. I mean, as an actress, it's a, it's you're not really welcome yeah. to express your opinion normally. Or you can, but only in terms of your performance. So I was very intimidated and very nervous um, to speak uh, to speak to people with any kind of authority, and it's interesting because um, you know now I'm very much like bossy and feel fine about it, <laughs> but um, but I think in the beginning I could have been a little bit more confident. It's one of those tough tough things to do because you don't want to be the person who gives your input and then leaves the room and all the writers are like, oh god, what an idiot! Get the producer out of here. <laughs> you can really tell she didn't go to college. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I was terrified. Terrified that they would just be like, oh, she's so dumb. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but you just have to get over that. You'd be like, who cares if someone thinks I'm stupid? How did, you, how did you get over it? Was there a specific moment where you found that you were right and you could kind of say, like, no, see, this is what we're trying to do here? Yeah, I think that the more things happen that validate my choices or my opinions or the things I was fighting for, and even just getting this made, the so fact that you're the that person somebody, who optioned it, who yeah, saw it initially, yeah. But the fact that 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 this was my idea, and there's validation in the fact that somebody was like, "Oh yeah, I would make a great TV series." You know what I mean? Just those little things as you go along, I think, are such confidence builders and make you f you feel so much more secure in voicing your take on things. You know, now the the book is a work of historical fiction, and uh, a novel can maybe make up you know one season uh, of of a show, and but this show can go on for multiple seasons. How did you guys decide to sort of not stretch the novel, but sort of create your own version of historical fiction as well within Zelda's story? Well, one of the concepts with this. Uh, is really showing how much their marriage is in all his novels and how much she contributed just through the, her life to his, uh, to his books. Um, so the, the idea is to do five seasons um, for one season for, per book leading up to, you know, so that you get to see their lives and then, oh, that book came from that experience. One of my favorite stories of Zelda and Scott is that uh, while she was in the asylum, he was trying to write Tender is the Night, which is the book about his marriage with her. And she was like, nah, 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 I'm going to write that. And she wrote it in two months. <laughs> There's this amazing transcript, actually. It's an actual transcript from the first asylum she was in where they are having that argument of who gets to write about her experience in the, who gets to write about her experiences in the asylum. And... Um, it's just fascinating because it's re it's a transcript. So, so it's amazing to read because he, he's just like freaking out about ownership over their life, and it, it's incredible to see that this was really one of the main problems in their marriage was who got to own their life experience. What was his argument for for owning it? Was that he was the writer, he needed their life experience to make money for them, and that she was being ridiculous, and that. Uh, it just she couldn't write about it because he needed to. 
Um, and, and the argument was really her saying, but this is my, my experience. I'm the one here. How can you take this from me? He's like, eh, you're crazy. Yeah, he's like, isn't she crazy, doctor? I thought so. <laughs> I'm going to go get drunk and not be called crazy for it. <laughs> right. He's the crazy one. That must be uh, such thrilling source material to work from, especially, I think, as you said at the beginning of this interview, in this particular moment that we're, we're in, where we're talking about misogyny and women's rights and the sort of different versions that feminism has, has taken on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just, you know, like I said before, I think it's really important to look at the mistakes people have made and to look at the way we regurgitate the, the messages we get when we're younger. You know, if I live in a misogynistic world for long enough, I'm going to make choices that perpetuate that. I'm going to... Like vote for the candidate that <laughs> perpetuates that misogynistic... Whatever those things are, you know, I frame myself in such a way, introduce myself into a room in such a way, like not lead with my intelligence, lead with my charm, because I don't want people to think, uh, you know, whatever. But those are all... Those are all things that I do because I've taken these messages in and they're now affecting the way I, I compose my, or play, I behave. Um, and I think that that's really important because if we are half the population, then we must have something to do with this. Now, I would imagine that that is also something, and I, and I think I said this before, but that you greatly relate to as being a child actress, sort of how you enter a room, how you carry yourself, and what you, you lead with, just for the sake that you were a young kid going on auditions. Yeah, it's true. I do think a lot about that. And I also, a lot of the way I conduct myself as an adult is based on what I was taught as a child. Like reacting to what you were taught as a child and sort of or rectifying? Or continuing to act that way and then realizing it gets me in trouble. Like, I would often, when I was a kid, like, people didn't like a precocious child. So I had to pretend I wasn't so smart. So as a woman, sometimes I will find myself, like, acting not so smart just so no one feels threatened. And it's like, that's crazy. What are you doing? Because then people are just going to treat you like you're an idiot. Um, and, I, like, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. And I feel like and that's another way I relate to her, like you're saying. Yeah. Uh, let's open up to the audience for questions. Who has a question? Right here. Hi. How are you doing Hi. today? Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm an acting school student, and I'm wondering, uh, it's widely reported that you actually had no acting school experience going to an actual acting academy. I was wondering how you go about approaching these characters and breaking them down and getting into something amazing, uh, as amazing as this character and breaking it down. Um, I think for me with her, I've, I'm incredibly lucky because she has so, there's so much material. I think the more you can really feel like you know the person, then you have the freedom within a scene to react in a natural way or, or to do something that sort of contradicts, you know, to just behave more normally and in a more relaxed way. Um, I think that that is really the key the key to out of convincing portrayals is to really feel a confidence in who you're playing. Like just really committing to your take on the person, um, whether it's right or wrong. Because people are going to interpret what you do anyway. So what you have in your head doesn't necessarily have to be the absolute truth. Next question. Hi, Christina. Thank you for being Hi. here. Um, so I'm a native of Asheville, North Carolina, uh -huh. where I was always told uh, Zelda spent a certain period of time institutionalized. And I'm wondering if you ever had the chance to visit there or you spent any time in the area. I haven't, but I hear it's beautiful. I know, isn't there a lot? There's a, they record a lot of albums there, right? Or they used to? Yeah. yeah. I know some people who recorded albums there. Yeah. I might show up. <laughs> Plug for Asheville, North Carolina from the audience. <laughs> Uh, next question. Hello, Christina. Hi. First, I'd like to compliment you on the series. Thank you. You're welcome. I'd like to compliment you on your career, too. You have an impressive body of work, which I feel the array of characters you played has allowed you to test your acting skills, and you're very good at it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have two questions. First off, with this character, what were some of the intriguing things you found out about her as you researched her for the role? One of the things I really loved about Zelda that I read, and it's one thing that I really love when you read about really strong women in history, uh, is this sort of ability to make lemonade out of lemons. And her daughter, Scotty, always said that no matter what was going on, no matter what kind of breakdown or drunken debauchery or whatever, Zelda always made her feel like life was magic and that things were fun and, and made her feel safe and, 
and, and she also, Zelda did that also, like Hemingway's first wife, she reached, she felt so, like reached out to her um, when she had no one in Paris. And I like that Zelda was in her heart a really loving, warm human being. Because if you have that core, then all the other stuff, you don't excuse it, but you can at least explain it. Um, and you're with her. And my other question is, were there any challenges you faced bringing her story to life, be it from an acting standpoint or as an executive producer? Yeah, I mean, there have been a lot of challenges with this. I think it's, it's hard for people to, um, it's hard for everyone to have the same take on characters like this. So for everybody to decide what, what, ver you know, what version or what perspective or all that stuff, I think is difficult. It's also difficult, for me it's really difficult because I don't ever want people to think that we're Scott bashing. You know, that's not the point of this. It's not to malign him the way she was maligned. It's just to be honest about, a, it's a relationship drama, you know, and nobody's right or wrong in any, in, in any relationship. Well, I mean sometimes, but. Uh, <laughs> but in, our, in this situation, we're very much, it's not to, to slander him. And I really, I, I've noticed that people, some people who really love him and hold him dear, have gotten offended by this. And I just think it's, it's unfortunate that in order to tell her story, people feel that we are, are you know, uh, bashing him. That's, that's so strange because, uh, thank you for your question, because you know there are great writers who you can talk about their personalities and they don't have to be as wonderful as the writing. I mean, as we said, Ernest Hemingway, not a very nice guy. Right. Beautiful writer. Norman Mailer, by no means, a, by any stretch of the imagination was he a nice guy, but in, incredible works of art that he's written. There's no reason for F. Scott Fitzgerald because Gatsby and This Side of Paradise are such tender, beautiful books that we have to assume or make believe that he was just as tender and beautiful as a person. Yeah, it's interesting. And what's so funny is that people just rejected and maligned him while he was alive. You know, he always felt like the, when they went back to Princeton, and it, at Princeton he was just rejected and the professors thought he was an idiot. And um, so it's funny now that that same sort of uh, patriarchy really wants to protect him and hold him close. Or maybe it's not patriarchy, I don't know. Women feel that way too, I can't say that. Um, but I mean, it's interesting to me that, that now he's protected and no one wants to slander him when his, during his career people are like, oh, that drunk, you know. <laughs> I have uh, one more question before we go, and uh, I think I saved it for last because I might be wrong, but the novel was not called The Beginning of Everything, was it? No, it's the Zelda Fitzgerald novel. So where did The Beginning of Everything come from and what to you does that mean? Um, the beginning of everything is from a quote by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, I love her and she is the beginning of everything. And for us, you know, we want each season to have um, a different, it'll have like a different chapter title. Because the idea of this is that it's, you know, it's a five hour movie with half hour chapters kind of thing. But then each season will have a different chapter title. And um, with this one, it is the beginning of everything and it's important. It, it kind of shows that he didn't feel his life took off until he found Zelda. That said, it also feels like it could be sort of explaining or the title of something much larger in terms of as we talk about fame and the way that she is viewed as a woman, the way that this relationship works under the spotlight of fame, that is, it is also sort of the beginning of, of that as well. Yeah, it's true. Well, um, thank you so much for being thank here. You. Z, the beginning of everything, starts streaming January 27th, and it's really fantastic. Congratulations. Christina Ricci, everybody. Thanks, guys.